Enduro Method is an online strength and conditioning program built for those who ride by those who ride. We are professional coaches dedicated to building the best and most revolutionary off and on the bike training for dirt bikers around. Enduro Method offers a monthly subscription, which gives you access to our ongoing current training program. By subscribing to Enduro Method, you receive our Iron Track, which is for those who have a gym or gym equipment, and our Gravity Track for those with minimal to no equipment. We design our training for riders who want to keep their general physical preparedness in top form year round. We also offer more specific training plans that you can purchase anytime. We have built an eight week hard enduro training plan designed to get you ready to race with structured off and on the bike workouts, all in a comprehensive eight week plan. If you are interested in joining the monthly Enduro Method training subscription, we are offering a special discount for our podcast listeners. Use discount code EMPODCAST23 in all caps for 50% off your first month of training. See the show notes where you can find discount codes and a link for more information and to sign up for Enduro Method. And now, on to the show. And we're up and running. So today, um, really grateful to have you guys on the show. Thanks for coming on. We've got Steve and Denise Hatch. Uh, maybe for those not as familiar with you guys or what you do, just give a brief intro um, into yeah what you do and what you're doing now. Well, thanks for having us on here, Josh. Um, so my name is Steve Hatch. I, I grew up in upstate New York and got into dirt bikes like most, riding in the field, and then uh, I really thought that it would just be a fun hobby, and then it turned after college into trying to do it for one year professionally, and that lasted for 18 years, so I've been blessed to do what I love and coach and ride and mentor and train riders now after I've been retired um, from racing professionally all over the country and the world. Um, so now it's giving back and working on all facets of making individuals better on the dirt bike, but moreover in life. Awesome. And Denise. Yeah. So Denise Hatch, Steve's wife, AKA, um, I have a background in exercise, physiology, nutrition, uh, hypnotherapy, long time yoga. So I've combined all those things and worked in professional sports for many years, probably uh, 23 years dating myself um, and just, you know, helping people with Steve alongside of Steve to be their best, both in sport and in life. Awesome. Yeah. It's a very, I mean, between the two of you, it's a very powerful couple in the sense of, you know, having that on the bike sport side riding training and then just the mental and more spiritual if you will off the bike and being able to combine um that's really cool mm -hmm. it is it's well-rounded yeah definitely because i i do feel that there's a probably a lot more of a focus on the physical aspects of it um, always and the mental side's definitely coming along but mm -hmm. that's a very nuanced topic as well um and there's Becoming not more and more accepted Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and what's funny, I have a couple things on here to note later, but the what what style of motivation people are drawn to, right? Because there's a lot out there. It's like the David Goggins out there is just like yelling at you and telling you to do more. And that's great for some people, but then other people, it either offend, it almost is offending or makes them feel less, right? So there's a big balance of trying to figure out um, how that connects with each individual what works for one might not work for another yeah definitely yeah, and i think to add to on what you're saying josh the i think the cool chemistry between denise and i that really works like you're saying we kind of have both spectrums you know i've come like you said from the dirt bike side but i'm more of the the masculine style of you know let's go and 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 you know pushing that way to a certain degree and being a racer and competitive but denise she didn't tell you but it was all american diver and different things so she's competitive too but comes from the feminine side so a lot of the riders nowadays especially the younger ones are not the typical ones of you know my age if you will years ago they come more in with both the masculine and feminine and are more well-rounded than the older guys or you know in different sports it's you know that'll make you tough you know beat yourself up like david you know coggins idea 
which for some it works and for others that'll just flatten them they'll hate the sport and they'll get out of it or whatever they're doing in life right yeah and i'm curious from the coaching side like what what do you guys look for when you're working with somebody right i mean I, you'll hear a lot more talk maybe on what you look for in a coach and how can they help you what do they specialize in but when you when you're looking to really focus and work with somebody what are the attributes that are very um endearing i guess or uh kind of you kind of look for and go yes that's something i can work with i think real quick for me it's are they coachable that's the number one thing everybody wants to be a pro or be a champion or be the best that they can in life but if they're not coachable i say the old one you can't push a soft rope you can pull it gently so if if i'm gonna you know have to you try to push them and they're not going to go or they're not coachable. It's not going to be a win-win situation. So that's the main thing I look for. Do they have that drive and they want it more than anything in this world? And even if they don't have the bike or the finances or whatever, they'll find a way to succeed. And that's why I want to coach because they're on a, a clear cut path to do what it takes. And as all three of us know, it, you know, everybody else asks me, what does it take? I'm like, it takes whatever it takes. Some people, it might take five years to be the best of what they do and they have tons of natural talent. Others, it might be 25 years or whatever. So I think there's no time limit. But for me, it's definitely coachability and that they want it and they're going to listen because we can all know all the answers and it doesn't really matter if they're not going to listen. Yeah, I, I agree with Steve. It, you know, it's all about coachability. And for me, in having been working with athletes for a lot of years, um, I, I like to we cultivate champions, right? Like we work with people to bring them to the very top level and we'll stay with them for years. Sometimes we've had people for years that we've just continued to work with over the course. And in my perspective, you know, I like to have, you, you watch these young people grow these massive social media platforms and gain a lot of um, fame. And so for me, I always ask people that I work with, uh, what are you going to do with that? You know, you get to that level and then how are you going to turn around and give that back? And that's really important for me and the people that I work with. Right. So not just exactly what you're doing currently or where you're at, but how are you going to use that in the future and all these things you're cultivating and building, where does that lead to? Exactly. Yeah. I think that's really important too, because it is very easy to get caught up in the moment and think whatever you're currently doing is the way it's always going to be. But it's not like a, it's not like you have a foot out the door, the exit plan, but you're also just trying to build things for the future. It's right. And, you know, one of the things that we see often is that the identity is so connected to this moment in time, the, the sport, and then the transition out of the sport has ruined a lot of people, has really been very difficult for a lot of people. So it's a really big thing to understand, you know, I'm this right now and I can be the best I can be in this moment in this sport. And I also have this idea of where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do with it um, down the road. And that makes, I think that makes transition a whole lot easier out of a sport at that level. Yeah, um, not having your entire identity wrapped up in what you're doing because it's not it's not who you are, right? It's part of who you are. But when that becomes everything, um, you know, especially too, right? If something takes you out of that sport, like an injury or um, something that is unforeseen, but if everything you are is wrapped up in that, um, that can be very problematic moving forward. Very. Um, what are some of the attributes that you see get in the way the most of people making progress? Like from a, from an athlete perspective, if, um, you know, that you see working with people that you can, that are holding them back from progressing. Uh, I think some of the things that get and stand in the well stand in the way whenever i ask somebody an athlete what stands in your way the most they usually always respond me, it, it, me themselves right like it, it's their own i believe um the way they think about themselves the the way um the way they believe or don't believe in themselves um so i i guess probably 
not believing or not belonging, um, not thinking that they deserve or um, non-coachability. I think those are some of the things that can really stand in the way of an athlete progressing. What about you, Steve? Yeah, I totally agree with Denise on that. That's a huge one. I think the other big one that most miss is who you're surrounded with, right? You're only as good as who you're surrounded with. So some, and, and a lot of it, you know, if you obviously go backwards on how it got there, a lot of times it's the mom or the dad or whoever wants to help them, which is awesome. And they love them. So they try to help them and then they try to push them more and they help them, which is awesome. But at a certain point, sometimes they can become almost at a point where they need to high five and get a different coach or a different trainer or do something else. Because sometimes that, that turns into somebody that might be negative or have a, a disempowering way of it, trying to piss them off to go faster or to be better at their sport. So I think, I think that, um, that part of it, and it could be anybody, it could be obviously parents, could be, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, it could be um, friends, you know, anybody around you that's not have your best interest, they'll drag you down. You can have 10 people that love you and most empowering and one that thinks you're an idiot or hates to see your success and it will take you backwards. So I think that's a big one that you got to surround yourself with great people. Yeah. Uh, what is that saying that you're, you're the representation of basically of the five people you spend the most time with? Um, so true. Yeah. No, I, I think so. And I, it's, I can look back at my own life and just see, like, it's hard in the moment to maybe recognize that, but looking back, I'm like, Oh, yep. It's pretty <laughs> realistic. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. And you, you're having such a good time. You didn't realize that maybe there was whatever jealousy or they, you know, you want to go and have fun with them. So therefore you skip your workouts or whatever. It's always, it's always choices. And that's what I, you know, we, we tell our riders, it's like, I always say you can make excuses or you can make it happen, but you can't do both. So you got to decide right. it's the same with friends. Yeah. Um, when you're working with people, how do you look to see like when they're ready to progress from whatever phase you're in? I feel like uh, it's very easy to do something a couple of times, feel like you're got it dialed and then want to jump to the next thing, maybe before prematurely, right? Before you're ready. So like, what are, do you have some markers um, just general that you kind of have in mind? Like, I want to see this person be able to do this, whether it's, um, you know, uh, like a technical skill or, um, something like a meditation practice, like enough reps, and then you kind of make the move to the next thing. Go ahead, Denise. I got one for riding, but I'll, if you've got no, one. No, you, you take it away. So on the riding side, for me personally, <clears throat> with the way I coach, I pretend they're going to do it a thousand times. <laughs> and at the, you know, and obviously when we began, including myself, I couldn't do it one time, nevertheless a thousand. So I think when you get something and say it's a corner and not dabbing your foot or not going out of the rut or whatever, a deep technical corner, let's say I do the thousand time rule, which sounds like a lot and it is, but I think, you know, there was a saying going around, I think on social media, not too long ago, but basically it was what it said was, you know, an amateur or beginner will do something till they kind of get the hang of it and a pro will do it till they can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the big one. So for me at my top level of racing or at my peak, I, you know, it's so subconscious. I mean, I could ride the bike and feel 10 times better on the bike and the feel of the tires and everything else better than I could walking in my sneakers or training or all the side stuff that I did. So I think that ability to, um, you know, A, be second nature where you're not like, oh, step one, outside elbow up, step two, slip the clutch, step three, it's really habitual. And that takes a long time to get there. But for me, um, you know, beginner riders, I give them the 10 time rule and we're doing the right way or even five if they're, they're really struggling. But, um, you know, and then the pros, it's like, all right, we do this 30 times perfect. We're on to the next thing. And if we don't, we're on there sometimes for two or three or five hours or the rest of the day. So I think that's the big thing. I think for me personally, too, the big thing that I, I, I used to do my clinics or used to do my coaching, okay, one hour on starts, one hour on breaking. It doesn't work that way. Some, some people will have it in five minutes. Other people will take five hours. I'm, I've worked a lot, and Denise and I both did. We were moved three doors down from Taylor Robert. So we knew him since he was seven years old. And I remember going out when he started having us coach him, and I was in my prime racing, and he was like 12. And I remember taking him out there to, in Arizona to wheelie, tap the second whoop and then to go over on the third one. So a wheel tap of three whoops in a row on his little, you know, whatever, 65 KX, if I remember right. 
And I showed him that and I was like, okay, this might be half hour, an hour. He went Prayat! and tapped it and went back down. I'm like, hmm, maybe he got it just by luck. And the next thing I know, he did it three more times. I'm like, he's like, what do you think, Steve? I'm like, we're out of here. <laughs> you know, it took him about a minute. So it really depends on, on who and where and when, of course. But I think a good coach realizes when it's time to move on. You don't want to just, you know, do it forever when they already got it. But I try to be just ahead of them and always trying to raise them up as we go. Right. Yeah, and I think that implementation is also a, a big one there. If it, you know, as far as what I'm doing in the mindset, I'm given a lot of skills and practices. So is somebody actually putting that to work? Are they doing it and implementing it? I think that's big. And and the other thing that, you know, Steve and I do together is that, and I think that this is where we're really well rounded, and because we have the background that we do when we realize what somebody's after their goal, their vision, well, then we hold that for them oftentimes until they can hold it for themselves. You know what I mean? Like we, you know, sometimes it takes somebody else believing that you can and knowing that you got this until you got it until, you know, you got it. And so that's also, I think a, a level of, um, implementation or getting somebody to that level, holding that for them. And then before you know it, they're like, oh yeah, I got this. I, I, I can do this. And they're on to the next level. Right. So it's almost like you're creating a name or a target, right? So you have something that's up higher than you currently are, that might be a little bit pie in the sky, but you want a goal that's high right if you just have a goal that's eh, i could probably do that but you know so it's unachievable currently but then you're just building the roadmap and the steps and then um kind of holding them accountable to this goal and if they're doing the steps and getting the work done then they're on the trajectory to getting there kind of exactly idea. exactly and i think to add you know josh i know with a lot of the, like your training stuff and different things a lot of people have a goal way too high and a lot of people have yeah. a goal way too low. They can do yeah. it in an hour. So it's like, how do you get that realistic goal where you're not frustrated that it'll never happen? And it's not in five minutes, you got it. So I think a lot of people put their goals wrongly and, and it's just trial and error and who you are and how much perseverance. But a lot of people, you put too much of a big goal in front of them and they don't even know where to start. So it's, you know, the old paralysis by analysis. They don't even know, well, shoot, do I go run first or do I ride my dirt bike or do I go to the gym? Like, what do I even do? So I think on every facet of it, I think of it like the hub of a dirt bike and then the spokes going out, there's like 52 spokes, I think on the front wheel. That's just like us. We've got our, you know, say our strength and then we got our, you know, upper body strength and core strength and legs and dirt bikes and skills and, all of it goes together in mindset, nutrition, on and on. So it's really figuring out where we're at and then what's it going to enable us to really um, see how big of a goal to put on all of those. We kind of put a big overlapping goal on the whole thing. I want to win the championship. Well, yeah, that's a great one. But what if you break it down and, and what do you look at on those spokes? That's the first thing I do. I look at them and the ones like on pros, most of their spokes are long, like scale of one to 10. They're really good. They might be at eight, nine, 10, but a beginner, they might be a one or two. So the fastest way to improve is take all those spokes, circle the ones that are not very long, meaning they're, you're not very good at it. Fastest way to improve is work on your weaknesses. So that's the first thing we do. Even with the top pros, we'll look at that. I mean, they're pretty gnarly. So we have to like lift up every rock and look at, look everywhere to see where they're barely lacking but that's the big thing too right now that makes complete sense lowest hanging fruit and then go from there and then the idea of uh you know most people seem to what is it overestimate what they can achieve or underestimate what they can achieve in a year but overestimate what they can achieve in a week right Good point. And so like when you do you have any i mean this we'll see what you have for this question but do you have any general like realistic for someone who's, you know, they're out there, they're practicing, they're eating good, they're training off the bike, on the bike, all that stuff. But like, what are some reasonable expectations for improvements per year? Cause it's like you said, like, it's easy to be like, well, I want to win the championship. Well, I mean, obviously it depends where you're starting from, but it's probably not a very realistic goal to go and just like say that and expect to, to be in that position in the next year. 
I think for the riding side, the way I, I break it apart with my riders and the way I did it myself for 18 years as a factory rider, um, like you said, it has to be a, a big goal, but not too too big or too small. And then secondly, you have to you have to know where you've been, right? So you have to track it. And, you know, if you don't track it, you don't know. So even lap times is one thing that can tell you. Heart rates, obviously, in the training side, different things, and then track incrementally are we getting better are we staying the same are we getting worse you know and i think that's the big ones that a lot of people just um don't really have a a speedometer or or a place to even start so and the other thing with with all of our programs i've got you know 20 years worth of writing programs and starting with like taylor robert and ryan sipes and a bunch of our big guys in the beginning I still have all those. So if you don't know what you did last week or for the last month and then you started winning you don't really know how to duplicate that And the other thing is you don't know if you did something for the last month of training every day or different things, what was the cause of having that failure in your performance or your results. So I think that's the tracking for me is a really big one that a lot of people miss because it's not really convenient and this and that. So I think tracking and making sure that your graph is always going up. You're going to have some peaks and valleys, but it should keep going up in general. Yeah. And from, from the mental side or mind side, I mean, that's, I would assume it's harder to track. Um, you don't have, you can't go lap times or whatever. So how do you, um, and habits just in general are hard to ingrain and take longer. Are those are, are the daily habits into monthly habits? Like what do you kind of use as a benchmark to look for progress? Yeah, great question. You know, one of the things I say just to back up and answer your original question, like if somebody has this goal of championship, one of the things we always say to people is that you can't just go from here to here because you're not prepared for it. Even if you could go out there and get that national win, let's say, you won't hold it. And so there's this process that has to take place and everybody travels that process and that growth at, in a different scale. They're, they scale differently. And so mentally, um, you know, it, it is... I think what we look for mostly is somebody implementing, taking seriously the skills and tools that we give. And at what point do they begin to hold themselves? So we can, we can actually watch that. We see it all the time where we're holding somebody to their goal and vision. You know, you can do this, you can do this. Here's how you're going to do this. Here's the steps to do this. And, and you can visibly see when somebody goes from that, I'm counting on you to hold me to, I totally got this. Now I know my, I know what to do. And that is that they're showing up prepared. They're showing up doing all the things that the, the skills, tools, practices they've been given because, you know, that never changes. Even when one arrives and gets that first win you can't just let go of what got you there. So by seeing somebody hold on to all those things that got them there, it's a level of maturity, knowing how they got there and what they got to do to stay there Mm -hmm. and accomplish that championship. So, you know, it's really, it's clearly visible to see in a person when they get those steps, when they arrive to that place, because they're putting that, uh, the things that we give into practice and they're holding it for themselves. And then they start believing in themselves. And, and then before you know it, you know, then we're done. They, we know clearly when they're done with us because they totally have it. They right. got it they hold it themselves. Yeah. They've been able to ingrain and implement it into daily activities and whatnot. Exactly. Consistent yeah. wins, maybe yeah. even championships. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As what, how would, I'm curious on, and I would be curious if you each have a different definition, but what is, what is mental toughness um, to you and what does it mean? Go ahead, Steve. So, so for me, you know, and coming obviously from more of the guy side and, you know, I was into all the other sports and yada, yada. So I think um, Partially, you can be born with it for sure. And that's a drive and a determination and a relentless pursuit to never, ever, 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 ever go up, go give up, excuse me. So that's, a, in my opinion, a, a relentless mindset, if you will. But the second one that I think is even more important, because a lot of people have that, is can you see it through to the end? And what that means is it's a muddy day. It's 27 degrees out. Nobody wants to ride their dirt bike for nine hours up in the mountains in this race. 
and you're probably going to freeze in the resets and everything else, say in enduro. Um, do you have the mindset to a go through it and b not be affected by it? So what I mean by that too, as far as being that that mindset, like you you mentioned, Josh, do you get you know, it, it, a typical good one is like, obviously we just had the Super Bowl. A typical good one is watching the difference between maybe a, a high school team or even a good college team. They're all gnarly anyway nowadays. And a pro team when it's blizzarding out, the pros barely look like there's any snow flying in the, in the air. They still catch the ball. They're still barely fumbling the ball. They're really, really good. Same with a pro dirt biker when it's, you know, mud and snowing they're barely much slower than they are when it's dry and perfect. So I think the mental toughness comes from, for myself, and I've won most of my nationals and big races and championships I won were in the gnarly stuff. And in New York's pretty gnarly, it's cold, it's miserable. I mean, it's you know nice today, but it's usually twenties um, in this time of year. And it's muddy and it's to go a mile back here in the mud and tree roots and rocks is, terrible, you know, especially now that I've ridden all over the country or all over the world. So I think where you come from helps build it a little also, but that steadfast, steadfastness mentally to know you yourself enough that you will persevere through it. And that doesn't come just the first time you go in a muddy race. You might quit and go, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. I'm going to take up golf. But after you do that a few times and you're like, oh, you never give up on yourself, Steve, or yourself. Um, and you start to realize that that's a pattern that you're mentally and physically tough. Um, it, it gets ingrained in you. And I think that's, you know, where I got to, and that's, that was one of my biggest strengths was training and then never giving up. So I think that's the mental strength that I, I gathered. And you can, you know, Denise worked with me on the mental stuff and, and ingrained that also on different ways and different tools, but just the old redneck style of trial and error. That's how I got it to begin with. Well, I think, I think that first of all, the dirt biking creates mental toughness. I mean, anybody who's willing to get out there and really push themselves through, you know, the resolve, the unwavering, the steadiness that Steve's talking about um, creates that mental toughness. Um, but one of the things that I think is really important on the med mental side is the unwavering aspect of belief in self, belief in one's ability, belief in one's skill. And not to say that, you know, even the very top elite, which I've had the, the great opportunity to work with, don't waver, they can. They just know they waver much less often. And they actually know what to do with it when that shows up, when that not enoughness, which is in our own human nature, can show up, which it often does when we're injured, when we're up leveling ourselves, when we're facing something that's difficult or challenging, that un, that wavering can show up. But the toughness, those that have developed the toughness actually know what to do with it. They have the practices and the skill to put it in place and go up, oh, see you. I, I recognize that it's not who I am and have created another neurological pathway or groove or belief in self enough that they know what they're capable of. They know what they can do. And so I would call that a mental more, more than mental toughness, a mental unwavering. Hmm. Um, and, you know, and then there's an awareness of, there's a, a really big awareness of when that wavering is happening when I'm not fully resolved or fully believing in myself, um, you know, you can catch it and turn it around and have the practices, skills and, and tools in the tool bag to be able to do that. But I think, um, you know, one of the things that separates people in that toughness is injury. And you'll very, very um, quickly see at young ages when people get injured, who has that toughness and who doesn't based on injury, you know, because some people will get injured and go, nope, not that hanging that I'm selling that. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it, I don't know, it's a fine line between toughness and, and intelligence. I'm kidding, but um, you know, some people can just get through it and, and just step up and keep on going. Like, yeah, there might be some things I got to look at in this, but they just, they're, they're tough enough to, handle the adversity and adapt and keep on going. Interesting. 
Um, yeah. And I've, I've always thought too, like there's definitely some level that, you know, people are have from parents or genetically or whatever, but it's also something that can be trained. Agreed. And the tools to do that seem, well, not all obviously, but one is definitely just the discipline of showing up over and over. And when you have that over time, that's like a kind of a bedrock or foundation you can lean back on for when you have those moments of doubt or something like that, because you've built this track record of showing up, of putting in the time, putting in the work, and um, you don't have that sense of like imposter syndrome or I don't belong here. I mean, maybe still, but like you said, you can almost recognize it. It enters in and you just kind of watch it go out on the other side. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that that's re another really important thing to be aware of in mental toughness or in mental unwavering is that our thoughts are constantly in movement. They're, they come in waves, right? And so one of the things that we do is we work with the breath to make the thoughts less tsunami and more surfable waves. But, you know, what you just said about watching that thought come in and watching that thought go out is realizing that we're not really our thoughts and that we don't have to make story out of them. We don't have to buy into them. And when we recognize that that our thoughts are always happening, but we can dip deeper and have a an anchor, like in the bottom of the ocean, as we watch the waves go through, it's those anchors. What anchors you? And for each person, that's different. I mean, for some people, it's consistent wins, those small wins. For some people, it's the powerful training and feeling really like for Steve, it was knowing that he was most fit. For some people, it's, um, you know, it's, it's the mental training. It just depends on who that person is and what that anchor is to make them mentally tough. And I, I think that's an individual thing. And I think it's something that has to be kind of teased out of each person, if you will, like, what is it for you that's going to make you that tough? Right. And then let's develop that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, it almost, it goes back a little bit to just having that sense of purpose. Right. Um, totally. Cause that's going to give you, yeah, your, your why which is all the buzzword rave stuff right now. But um, mm -hmm. it is true because when you do have that, like a true understanding of what you want to achieve, it sets that lighthouse up here. It's that target yes. that you can always look back on. And, you know, if you get off track a little bit, like we all do, you can look back and go, okay, this isn't actually advantageous to my goals. So I need to make these changes or whatnot. Um, I don't remember what book it was, but, a great quote was uh we don't have a, um people don't have ideas ideas have people mm. and it's a much more macro look at that but it's very true i was like wait have i ever had an original idea <laughs> i don't think so i've had i've pulled from a bunch of different ideas and thought it was my own but i'm really kind of a product of my own experience um yeah it's interesting well, and it's also interesting because here's a little piece of science, which I find fascinating. Your desire, as you were talking about your why, your desire, like, why are you really out here doing it, doing this? Why are you pushing yourself through this, this mental toughness or physical toughness to accomplish? What is it that you desire? What is that why? It's really important because that carries so much more power than your thought. Like if I think I want to go win a championship or I really have this desire, there's something in me that really desires it. It's very, very different. It's two different places. I think one is from the head and one is from the heart. And anything that comes from the heart, which is desire, emotion, and such is will carry, as science says, 5,000 times more power than that from the brain, the thought, the thinking mm. I might be able to do it, the thinking I want to do it. Right. And then the thinking and the speaking of it potentially is, I don't want to say detrimental, right? But you almost do get a dopamine hit from expressing your desires to other people, right? You get that like, oh yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And you tell somebody and then three or four weeks later, they're like, hey, how's the thing? And you're like, oh, I didn't really actually start it. 
<laughs> yeah. um, but then it's the oh, journey, God. right? In the end, when you do do the steps or do the workout, do the training, do the reading, do all the things, when you get to the end of the journey that you were on, um, everything you remember is that journey. It's not even the accolades at the end, whether you win or lose, like you remember and you appreciate the steps you did to accomplish the task so much more than if you are standing on the podium or not. Isn't it true? It's all about the journey. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I say it kind of exactly what you both are talking about when you're learning a sport or business or life, it's, it's the questioning, or we're talking obviously some mindset and, and the why and all that. So when you go to a race, let's say when you're just beginning, you've only been to five, one race or five races or 10. I mean, I'm up into the thousands by the time I retired. So it's a questioning, which Steve has going to show up the slow one or the fast one, the one that crashes a lot the one that's not prepared, the one that is prepared, all these questions. But if we break it down and my mom and dad were school teachers and sister, so it probably comes from there. But it's like if we're going to take a test and if the three of us are going to take a test in six months and we say, all right, let's meet on Zoom. We're going to study for three hours, 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. And then, you know, 7 to 8 p.m. at night for six months every day. It's going to be a knowing we're ready to take that test and we're going to get an A on it. Or we're going to rock the test because we studied our butts off. Just like racing, if you haven't done the homework in the gym or on the bike and all of this and haven't put in that whole time and been doing other stuff, it's not a knowing you're going to perform at your highest because you haven't done the work. So right. it really gets down to that questioning. So when you do at the pro level, like what, you know, and Denise and I are blessed to work with a lot of driven people, but you still have to do the work for one and then for two it does turn in at beginning with them. Uh, and even somebody as great as like a Ryan Sipes we worked with, it was a question. We would always say, well, yeah, it will be a question until it becomes a knowing. And he was already doing great at Supercross and stuff like that. And he was like, what does that even mean? Until he started doing the doing part behind it. And then he realized towards the middle or now in his career, it's a knowing he's going to show up and be badass and ready to go and at the peak of his performance every single time. Right. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense. I mean, you can... Exactly that. You can show up to a race and you can have a or an event or ride or whatever it may be. You can have a great day and then feel like top of the world. And then just as easily the next time, you know, everything kind of goes wrong, not your best day. And at some point you feel like it's almost a crapshoot, but really it's more a lack of preparation and lack of laying the foundation to then be able to express your best work when it's called for. Absolutely. Hit the nail on the head. Um, injuries. How, um, well, what are some steps to bounce them back? Well, I think like Denise mentioned before, one of the big ones, and unfortunately I was a pretty aggressive rider. So what that equates to is sometimes you win, other times you land on your head. Um, so I had a lot of broken bones here and there in my career, but I think the the, the the steadfastness of um understanding that for one that that's part of the part of the deal i mean look at motocross supercross that's tenfold in my opinion <laughs> the top half the top field of the top guys are out of the out of the series halfway through the season because they come up short or long on a, a triple or a jump or whatever so anything has risk at, at this type of level of a sport so the injuries come with it. So you have to be, are you okay with that? You know, and I, nobody wants to be injured. I always say, when's a good time to be injured? Never, right? All my broken bones. You were like, oh, it'd be nice if it was the summer break and I didn't have to race with broken bones. The year I won the Enduro Championship, I had nine races. I think five of them I had broken fingers or broken toes or whatever. So you just persevere through it. So I think that's the mental toughness we were just talking about for one. But for two, when you're coming back for it, I think it's important to make educated decisions, know what you're dealing with, know how bad you're injured or not, and then take little stepping stones, even as simple as say you broke your collarbone and you need to be out for whatever, three, four weeks or whatever it is, do what the doctor says within reason. They're gonna obviously go towards the high side. But then secondly, as it gets three weeks in or four weeks in, can you do a push up? And then does it still hurt in the next day? Can you do 10 push ups? Isn't it sore? And no, it's not. Or yes, it is. And how much can you push yourself to be methodically day after day getting better without going one day backwards on your on your healing? So that's how I always attacked it. And it stunk and it hurt. And but um, I think that's just part of the sport. And I think the best at anything. And like Denise said, the 
dirt bikes are, are tough. You know, there's a lot of sports that are tough. And if, uh, you know, if, if you, you, if you're going to not be able to handle that part of it, it's probably not for you. And that's fine too, or just back it down. You know, nobody has to be stupid to hit a tree. We were just idiots at the top level and willing to go buy the trees. And I never thought of hitting any of them that I hit, you know, if you did, you never go that fast past them. You know what I mean? So I think that's the other big one too. What's your commitment level? Right. What about layover stuff on the mental side? Um, just sure. that risk reward side part of it. Sure. That's a, that's a big side. And, you know, we work with that a lot and the thing is, is that, you know, in your, in your mind, even if you're tough, you can think I can overcome this, but the truth is that injury can set into nervous system. Mm -hmm. So there's automatic responses happening for people that are getting back out there after um, a, a big crash and a big injury because it's in the nervous system. So the way I approach that is I work with the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's the rest and digest nervous system. So that's where a lot of the hypnosis comes in, um, is to engage the parasympathetic and reframe the crash, reframe the injury, um, re, uh, basically rewrite what's happening in the subconscious mind and uh, give the nervous system, that nervous system, a break to reframe by engaging parasympathetic nervous system. Right. And the reframing is that in a way like um, regaining control in a yes. sense. Sure. Um, um, or, or even taking somebody through it, um, even taking somebody back into how could you have, uh, let's replay that without the crash. Let's replay that in another way, saving that. Um, uh, or let's just begin to work on how strong the body is and how capable you are at keeping a heightened focus as you go back in. So there are many ways in which to work with it, but to help people get a, a reframe in their in their minds about it. Because, you know, it, it can be tough for people who go through big injuries to get back out there and, and go the same speed. Or like Steve said, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot. It's, it separates those who uh, can't overcome the injuries to those who can and will stay in the sport and ride at the same pace or level or up right. that level. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. Dane had had a crash at in the one of the hard enduros last year up in Montana, and it was on just a real steep downhill. It wasn't terribly long, but super steep, and it was raining, so real muddy, and it's like bentonite clay, super slick. And she had got off the bike to be quote unquote safe and walk it, and ended up slipping, and the bike came on top of her, and her foot peg actually caught her on her on her hip and tore like an eight inch. It was not like, yeah, it ended up being called like the shark bite. But I mean, at this much area, just wide open on her hip and, um, you know, pretty big ordeal. And we've talked about it since she's come back to riding. And like, you know, the first couple of rides back, it was just that not having control aspect of it. You know, the bike was now not something that she rode necessarily, but it rode her in a way like just didn't feel comfortable. Um yeah, so she's been, you know, had to kind of go through some of these aspects of it to to back to riding. And I mean, she isn't doing great and enjoying it, but there was definitely an entry back in that would, you know, took some time. And for and our goal is to make that time much shorter for people who have to get back out there and ride at that pace again. Right. And I, and I think to add, you know, I, I deal with that obviously a lot myself when I was racing at that level and then working with riders, so going through it. And a lot of them, same idea, like with, you're saying with Dane, it might be some of them say going across a field really fast on their motorcycle and it gets head shake and they cartwheel, you know, 50 miles an hour. They never want to go fast again, right? Because that's right. A, it's set in there, right? So one way I do it is to bring them back, not quite to 50 miles an hour, but I'll get them used to going 20 miles an hour until that becomes normal again. And then 30 miles an hour until that becomes normal, 40 miles an hour until that becomes normal, 50 miles, maybe different form, different style, different um, 
clamping better, different things. So we'll tweak some stuff until that becomes back into that. Um, just like Denise reprograms the, the nervous system to go, well, you didn't hit that tree or you didn't crash going down that slippery downhill. You did. So we remember it. But then how do you replay it? And even for Dane doing that, I'd probably take her back out to maybe not one just as gnarly, but to take her on some you know slipperier downhills that are or slower or not as long and get used to getting back into that comfort of being, you know, a in control and then be a little out of control, but still in control so that you're really, you know, like the old saying facing the fears or facing what bit you and learning how to progress through it. And then it won't be a thing that haunts you going down downhills the rest of your life or for me hitting so many trees really, really hard and hurting myself. Um, I can't look at those trees or it'll bring back that memory almost. It doesn't anymore because Denise and I've done tons of work on those, but same deal. I mean, I crushed my, my spine and my back, um, you know, hitting trees head on and different things that were gnarly while leading GNCCs or races. So that took a lot to overcome. So you have to, like she said, reprogram it back in and then methodically go, well, you've missed, you know, I always joke, everybody's like, man, I can't believe you broke that many bones. I'm like, yeah. And I've probably crashed whatever, say 500 times pretty hard here and there, but you know, only 50 of them broke bones, but I've missed 10 million trees and I've hit 200 of them, you know, so the right. <laughs> trees are pretty good, but it's not perfect. So you have to kind of reprogram yourself to go by that tree again that you can't look at and go, oh, that was exactly the scenario of the one I smacked fourth gear wide open. Right. So it's almost the same as setting goals. You're just doing it in a different sense. Like if you say you have a fear of heights, the way to help overcome or at least get more comfortable with heights is not avoiding it entirely but making small steps to progress. So maybe, you know, your first step is to just go up to the top of the building, not even go to the edge of the building and look over. You just go on top, you're like, okay, I didn't die. I'll go back down a couple more times doing that. And then you could take a couple steps toward the edge of the building. You're still not really looking over the edge, but you're getting closer. But that same idea of just small steps to ultimate progression of what you're trying to achieve. Absolutely. That and, you know, working in the the subconscious arena of the mind too is um, is a really big one in fear or in anything that you're dealing with that is standing in your way is because the conscious mind, our thinking mind is only two to 12% of our mind's capacity. But the subconscious mind where those fears lie and rightly so when you've been hurt or you've fallen off or whatever, the subconscious mind is 88 to 92% of your mind's capacity. So getting through the doorways into that deeper mind, the operating system is where those things can be reframed. And it's, you know, so it's more than just these small steps towards, yes, that's one of the ways to do it physically, but mentally is to work in that unconscious operating system. And there are certain times in our day when the doorway between the conscious thinking mind and the unconscious mind is open. So what we do is we give people certain scripts, beliefs, um, mantras, repetitions, uh, ideas, suggestions. During that state, we create the state where we can get through the doorway and then enter that operating system or that unconscious mind to rewrite a script, to think a different way, to overcome that fear if you will yeah that's interesting i think it was um jordan peterson who talked about if you have things that you think about in your past that you still that still bring up anxiety when they come up you haven't dealt with them correct um what would be some tools to do that um like journaling like examining writing stuff down yeah. So I would say like writing the things down that you want to accomplish. Like if you know those things that are standing in your way, those things, those old things that you're talking about, anything that we have, if, if I have a reaction to something, there's something in there that's still working me. Or if I can't get over something, it's because something's still in there that's not allowing me to get to this next level or this next step. Um, the way we do it is we work in, well, repetition is the mother of skill, right? Um, but for us, we take it one step further and we work with those, those times. So there are four times in your day when that gateway to the deeper mind is open. 
you have access to it. So you can really be programming yourself or you can work with somebody like me to help get you there and program you. So I would feed back to you the things that you want to accomplish or overcome. But if you're doing it on your own, I would say to write the things out that you want to accomplish, get very clear on those goals, intentions. And then there are four times during your day when you have access to that deeper mind. So like, for instance, Josh, I could say to you, um, or, or, or let's take Dane, for instance, the, her crash. And I could say, hey, Dane, you'll go out and you'll go down that that slippery hill again and you'll be just fine. You'll you'll make it all the way to the bottom. And Dane could go, that sounds great, Denise, but my experience is that I fell in it. I got really injured, right? So how do we get past that? And so what I have, what the goal would be to get through that new, um, newly formed idea about herself or about her experience of herself by going through the doorway of the conscious to the unconscious. That's four times when you're deeply relaxed, when you're uh, highly emotionalized, mad, glad, sad, ready state on the start line, um, happy, angry, all that is a highly emotionalized. That doorway is open right before you go to sleep, right after you wake up. That's a hypnagogic state. So you have access to that operating system. And the last one is just physical demand on the body. So when you're working out, when you're practicing all those times, that doorway is open. So what you're saying to yourself really matters. It's like it's going right on in there and being written at that deep level in the operating system. So we work with those four states to, um, so if you journaled, for instance, Dane would come up with the ideas about herself um, to overcome that injury. And then during those states, she would reinforce those ideas, either through image or through repetition of mantra to herself, stating a goal, or through, um, you know, whatever it might be to rewrite at that unconscious level when that doorway's open. So one of the things that we do, for instance, on a start line, let's say, is there's it's a highly emotionalized state. People can be absolutely freaked out, you know, getting ready for that race. And so we hone the the mindset to think of these three things just these three things you get to pick them what is your focus and then when you're in that state you're going to breathe so breath is always going to lead the way to the mind we do a lot of breath work breathe and then state those three things that's it it's just those three things and if the mind begins to wander which it likes to do it likes to go off in you know nine to twelve directions at any given time we hone it back these three things. And so eventually those things are the repetition and then they become the mother of skill. They become your new belief. They become the thing that you can hone in on and focus on um, in those by using those states. Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah, breath work is definitely something I've been more and more interested in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, it seems like uh, something we all do constantly, but uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of awareness about it up until maybe yeah last year or two it seems to be more and more popular Probably. yeah even with the yeah. elite athletes you'd be surprised even the absolute elite athletes have not learned how to breathe correctly but like you said there's a lot more programs out there now or individuals out there teaching how to breathe correctly but you know it is something that we do automatically so people don't understand the value of it because we do it all the time every day all day but to understand how to use full lung capacity through your breathing, to understand how to develop greater lung capacity and more oxygen through certain breath techniques, to understand which breath techniques activate nervous system and which breath technique techniques deactivate nervous system. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a breath technique out there for everything. And if you are skilled at that, then you know, when you go out there and you got to get up for the game, like I got to go work out and I'm really feeling kind of down, or I got to go do this three hour race and I don't have an ounce of energy today or belief in my Myself, then there's a certain breath technique that would activate the nervous system to bring you up for that. Or if you go out there and you are, you know, you just 
you've got so much readiness, you are, you're pinging and you got to bring it down. Well, then there's a different breath technique that you're going to use on the line or wherever you are in your day, whatever you're facing to bring yourself back to a more normalized state. So there's, you know, breath is, I think it's, I think it, I think breath is, um, undervalued, under misunderstood, and not readily practiced enough. But it's the thing that I work with first, with anybody that I work with, it's the thing that we start with. It's foundational right. for anything. Yeah, and well, that and just everyday life, right? Because instead of more or less being able to be in control of emotions, we kind of are just reactive to them. Um, totally. Yeah, what is it? The emotions are great companions, but terrible masters. It's true. It's good and, one-liner. And like <laughs> being reactive to everything throughout your day, you know, breathing goes different, go into more sympathetic, you know, nervous system state. And you're always like just above baseline, but you're if you're constantly always above baseline, um, yeah, it's it's interesting times. And then the advent of social it, media and everybody's opinions totally, and everybody can right. touch people across the world. And totally. Yes. And so, you know, if you just even think about the time that we're in or how people are reacting to it, like mostly we are in a reactive state unless we've learned to respond. And I always say champions have learned to respond, mm -hmm. not react. And that's a very different state of being. Yeah. I think the other one throwing the breath into it that's interesting almost on the dirt bike side, whenever we get scared, we usually hold our breath, right? <laughs> we don't take deep breaths. So if you're, you know, like at the gym, if we put duct tape over half of our mouth or our mouth and just, you know, try to breathe through our nose on a hard cardio workout, we're going to be dying and our, and our heart rate's going to be at a million compared to what it would be um, if we had full oxygen. So that's like Denise said, it goes all the way through is the breathing is on the bike, which lowers the heart rate, which gets you into the flow state or zone state better. I mean, it goes on and on. There's so many facets to the breathing that seems so elementary to most, especially pros. For me, I was like, are you kidding me? What are we going to do that's cool? That's like about the mental. And he's like, right. well, we got to breathe. I'm like, oh my God, are we starting <laughs> at zero? Am I really that dumb? You know? And, uh, and then you realize, holy cow, there's such a big depth in it. And like you said, it's such a easy one to overlook. And it's, it's really one that once you master it, just like anything, people can say they want to be, you know, gnarly at the gym on weights or cardio, but if they're never there and they don't practice it, they're not going to get any better. You can want all you want but um, it'll never happen. So same with the breathing. It's really about knowing that. And that's a huge tool in your toolbox. But if you don't use it, then it's like having the best snap on toolbox with all the tools. But if you hate working on your bike, you're not going to use your tools at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think accepting it or realizing it's a skill in and of itself, even though we all do it every day, um, it's there's a lot more nuance there. Um, I remember just a quick aside, we did this was years ago. I think I read like Spartan up uh, the guy that started the Spartan races. He had a book and he had uh, people running like 10 miles with a mouthful of water or something. Cool. And I was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Wow. We'll do a mile. Right. So it was like a Saturday <laughs> workout, kind of more of a fun deal. So I had everybody take a sip of water and I was like, all right, you got to spit your water back in the cup. When you come back in, it's just a mile. You'll be fine. You can walk the whole thing. Um, doesn't matter how long it takes, just don't swallow the water and don't breathe through your mouth. And then when you come back, spit the water in the cup. And I was like, the best thing you can do is start walking. And then as you acclimate to the feeling of just nasal breathing, essentially, you can slowly speed up your pace, you know, and this and that. And, you know, half the class took off at a nice walk. The other half literally took off at a dead sprint. And then at the <laughs> corner, they're on the hands on knees, just, you know, dying and <laughs> uh, that was pretty funny but yeah it's interesting we've um played around with it a little bit i'd you know like to continue to learn and do more with it because i think it's very valuable and like what you said especially on the bike i mean hard enduro is a great example because half the time anything either scary difficult i'm like oh i really just literally didn't breathe for the last 30 seconds now i'm dying and I could have just been very calmly approaching these things, heart rates higher, pumped out, you know, all the things. So 
Yeah. yeah and you know, Josh, breath has to be trained just like a bicep muscle has to be trained. We have to learn yeah. how to do it correctly, right? Yeah. And there is, you know, there's breath techniques that actually build EPO, which is your performance enhancing enhancing drug. It's what Lance Armstrong got busted for taking. Like we can build that naturally. So it it is, I would say, it needs to be part of our training. Like, you know, like you just did with putting water in your mouth and running, learn to breathe through your nose. And, it, you know, it's, we have to train the breath as we train the body. Yeah. And I, I know real quick on a riding side, um, Ryan Sipes would tell me back when we were working with him with Supercross, if he held his breath, which he couldn't do it for the whole lap because the lap's like usually 50 or, you know, almost 60 seconds on a Supercross. But he said if he didn't do on purpose breathing out on the triple and breathing in, mm -hmm. that and if their heart rates were, were, were crazy or are crazy. They're usually 200 uh, roughly um, average for a whole Supercross. He said he could hold his breath some for one lap and not be able to ride two laps, basically maybe three without just redlining or having to slow down. Or if he got his breathing right and was like at 195 and calmer, even though he's, you know, pinning it, he could do 30 laps on the Supercross track compared to two. So it's a really big difference. Most don't see that it's like, they're like, eh, what's the big deal? But especially with what, you know, I did and a lot of our riders do the three hour GNCC wide open. It really teaches you if you're doing your breathing right and can lower your heart rate, you know, through training and through all of your skills and being more efficient and effective, it's night and day of how fast you can go, how long and still be at your top peak performance. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I doubt there's, I'm sure there's some, but I would bet there's a whole lot of people who pay no attention to breathing out on while they're doing their practice laps or interval work or any of that stuff on the bike. More than not. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Well, I want to be respectful of your guys' time. I um, feel like we could keep going for a while, but I uh, really appreciate both of you coming on. Had a blast. Hopefully um, listeners get some out of it. And maybe before we go, just how can people reach each one of you? Um, if you have anything out to offer as far as programs mm -hmm. or where they could look to get some info. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Technology. <laughs> Keep potential. buzzing over there. Yeah, potential spam call coming in. Go figure, right? Part of life. <laughs> um, at least it tells you nowadays. Uh, for myself, uh, stevehatchracing.com is where you can find me. And uh, Denise and I are a team on all this stuff, but uh, mentoring, training, and coaching. Um, we have all levels from starting at $19 a month all the way up to $10,000 a month. We have programs of all levels in all areas, as well as online programs. So Steve Hatch Racing, it is my side of the of the house, if you will. And then Denise can tell you on her side. My side of the house is rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, powerofthemind.coach. So it's powerofthemind.com, but dot .coach. And Steve and I have created some online mindset programs that begin with the foundation of breathing and take you all the way through what we believe cultivates a champion. And so we have uh, three programs there and it's, it's fantastic because, and as well as Steve, he has online programs in the writing and now we've got the online programs in the mindset. So um, that's been helpful to reach people who haven't been able to be with us. Great. Well, we will yeah put everything in show notes and um, put links out and spread the word and, Again, really appreciate both of you taking the time to come on. Our Thank pleasure, you. Josh. It's been nice talking to you. Thank you, Learning Josh. From Thank you. You. Thanks for uh, having us on here and your Enduro Method. And, you know, keep uh, doing what you're doing, changing lives and making people uh, enjoy the sport. So very cool. Thanks for uh, having us on. Awesome. Thank you.